Hey, and welcome to The Short Stuff. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and here's Jerry. And if you faint at the sight of blood or even discussions about it, you should probably stop listening now. That's right, because it is, it is a thing. Uh, it doesn't bother me. I don't, I don't love the sight of blood, but I'm not too easily grossed out. I can watch a, a surgery on TV, and I'm fine. I like writhing naked in blood. That's how much I love blood. <laughs> oh, good Lord. Covering my entire gigantic body in oh. blood. So anyway, um, if because I can do that, I clearly don't have, Chuck, a particular phobia about fainting at the sight of blood. And that's really what the whole thing is coming down to, as we'll see. But fainting itself and this particular kind of fainting, and this is a thing. Like, people actually do this. It's not like some movie or TV trope. Right. Although um, it is that as well. Yes. But when you faint at the sight of blood, there's a specific physiological faint that's going on. There's different kinds of fainting. And this one in particular is what's called a vasovagal syncope. <laughs> and vaso refers to your, um, like your blood vessels. Uh, vagal refers to the vagus nerve, which was, uh, played a huge starring role in our episode on what happens in the brain during an orgasm. That's right. The reason the vagus nerve gets a shout out in this this name for this um, this type of fainting is uh, because it has it plays a role in controlling the speed and rhythm of your heart, and then syncope is just another word for fainting for loss of consciousness. That's right. Uh, we know some things and don't know other things. We know that it is a uh, a legit phobia. It's about three to fifteen percent of people have this where they faint at the sight of blood. And we also know that it's not just the sight of blood. It can be an injury that you witness, uh, even like I think you pointed out here, like someone slamming their hand in a car, uh, or it can be needle-centric, like if someone's coming at you to give you a shot, you can pass out. So the technical name for the phobia is BII, Blood Injury Injection Phobia. Right. Um and it is a phobia because there's there's no real danger or anything to truly be feared from a you know a hypodermic needle or something like that. Uh, even though there is plenty of danger from it, th- it's still considered an irrational fear. You know what I'm saying? Sure. You're not in a horror movie, and they're not going to put it in your eyeball. So right, and so with phobias, um, BII is actually a peculiar type because with um, vasovagal syncope, you're fainting because you're your heart has slowed down enough that your blood pressure drops, which robs your brain of the um, very important blood it needs to function correctly, and you lose consciousness until your heart, you know, regains a nor- normal rhythm again, which it does on its own. And that means that BII is its own kind of phobia, because with most phobias, that's not how this goes down at all. No. Uh, with most phobias, you're going to, like, have a spike in your heart rate initially, and then that'll probably lead to like a fight or flight type of thing. It'll really ramp everything up. And with BII, you do have that initial uh, very brief spike in your heart rate, but then it just goes, boo, and everything slows down and you hit the bricks, basically. Yeah. So that makes it very strange. As far as they know, there's no other phobia that produces this effect, um, except for the blood injury injection phobia. But they... After digging a little deeper into this this um, kind of odd malady, frankly, um, they found that not only is it like is there a fear component, like in other phobias, there's also a, a disgust component, and that people who have blood injury injection phobia are experiencing levels of disgust that are even higher than their levels of fear. So it's just a really strange phobia all around, and it does seem to be its own type. Yeah, and it does. <laughs> It does. It's not funny, but it does make for funny moments in movies and TV shows when someone comes running into a room and sees something awful and they go, oh, my God. And that's the initial spike. And then because it does kind of follow it scientifically. And then they just go, oh, and, and hit the deck. And it is a trope for a reason, but it is interesting in that, like, scientifically, that's kind of exactly what happens. Right. So you want to take a, a break and then come back and talk more about BII phobias? Ooh la la, do I? Okay, 
Okay, so one one explanation for blood injury injection phobias is that there's it's a gene. It's, it comes from some gene or mutation that's passed down. We don't know very much about it, but if you consider that um, that it is conferred genetically, uh, that suggests that there's like an evolutionary aspect to this. That that somehow it made sense through natural selection. But it seems like the opposite of what would make sense through natural selection. Like if you're if you're approached with danger or injury or something like that, or you see someone else being injured, you would think you'd probably be in danger too. Yeah. And so um, running away really fast, fighting back, like you would think those would increase your odds of spreading your genes rather than fainting dead away. But there's actually a theory that says like, no, it kind of makes sense if you look at it this way. Yeah, and it's a theory, but uh, the theory goes that, like, let's say you're in a battle with Tuk Tuk and the gang, and Tuk Tuk gets clubbed on the head, and blood squirts out everywhere, and you go, oh, and you pass out and <laughs> hit the rocks. Mm -hmm. Then the other uh, invading, uh, I don't even know what era we are with Tuk Tuk anymore. What would they be? Tuk Tuk existed about 10,000 years before Utsi, so I'm okay. going to say... He existed about 18,000 years ago, prior to the advent of agriculture. All right, but what like what were they called? Those weren't Neanderthals, were they? No, they were modern humans. Okay. Um, they just hadn't <laughs> given themselves a name as far as we know yet. All right, so the other modern humans, the invading modern humans, they, <laughs> they, they run up at Tuk Tuk and Tuk Tuk, or I'm sorry, Tuk Tuk's friend, who is now passed out on the ground, and they just think he's dead and they walk right by him. Like it's the old play dead during battle thing. Right, which is, okay, that the makes kind of sense if you stop and think <laughs> of it, yeah. Um, the other thing uh, is if if it was Tuk Tuk himself who'd been injured um, and fainted at the sight of his own blood, sure. because of that drop in blood pressure, he would be less likely to bleed out from that wound yeah. or would bleed out more slowly, which could, in fact, also save his life, too. So, Not a bad um, theory. no. It also kind of is, depending, you know, but it's one of the one of the few we've got because we just don't understand it. Like, we, we understand the physiological component about what happens with vasovagal syncope. It's how the sight of blood or somebody shutting their hand in a car door or a hypodermic needle triggers that. It just, that's where we kind of lose our grasp on that. Um, and one of the one of the reasons why did what, what would you say like three to fifteen percent of the population yeah. has it? That's a really wide estimate too. Yeah, yeah fifteen percent is definitely significant, but three to fifteen percent that's a that's a big gap between you know those two numbers, and it's a big gap in our understanding. And one of the reasons why we understand it so little is because um, by its very nature that condition prevents people from going to the places where they could be treated and have their conditions documented and have estimates be a lot more accurate, which are like doctor's offices and clinics and things like that. Right. They avoid those places like the plague because those are the places where people get stuck with needles and have blood drawn yeah. and go when they have their <laughs> a huge gash in their forehead. Like, they don't want to go anywhere near those places. Yeah, because you go into that room and they say, well, let's see what's going on with you. Let me draw some blood after I slam my hand in this drawer looking for the needle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's coming at you from all directions. So <laughs> you're not going to go in there. You might even, uh, it can be tied to something called medical procedure anxiety, which sort of speaks for itself. Yeah. Uh, so you're not going into any hospital. So it's really hard to get great information about this. Uh, but uh, our old friend, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy can help you out, according to WebMD. And uh, there's a, <laughs> a Swedish psychologist named Lars Guren Ust. Nice. who apparently is the best in the business, and it is, like with a lot of uh, CBT, it's self-exposure. But what you do is, and this, this sort of makes sense, uh, what they do is they uh, tell you to, whenever you think of anything like this, and they, I think they start out by even saying, like, just think of driving to a blood donation center and put that in your brain, and you really want to tense up your muscles all at once, everything in your body, because that'll just get your heart rate going higher than it normally would be. Mm -hmm. uh, to get it elevated, and that's a way to combat, and then they just make it worse from there until they are basically playing doctor dress up and coming at with the needle. Yeah, so they teach you how to stave off fainting as step one, right? 
And then after that, when they're exposing you, it goes from making you imagine you're going to, to get blood drawn to actually showing you videos of people getting blood drawn to, like you said, your therapist coming in like he's a, a, a phlebotomist <laughs> with a syringe <laughs> and a tourniquet and actually putting the tourniquet on your arm. Yeah. And the whole time you're just tensing your core so hard, mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to keep from passing out. And it sounds awful. And exposure therapy is awful when you step back and look at it, but it actually does work. And what um, what they say is that possibly in as few as like three to five sessions of uh, learning applied tension and then use and then doing uh, exposure therapy, you might actually be able to look at blood and not faint, which is really something. Pretty good. I think if I was uh, the therapist, I would dress up like Nurse Ratchet. I would go full bore. <laughs> And then, you know, the person after would say, like, why, you, why are you wearing that wig? Why are you dressed like that? Yeah. And say, I don't know. I, I think it just it increases the anxiety is what I've found. I would dress up like the main character at the end of Promising Young Woman. Oh. That's what I'd come at you like. <laughs> Wowie wow. <laughs> yeah. Scary pink wig rubber nurse. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, I'm trying to picture you like that. That's Stop. pretty frightening. Stop that. I don't give you permission to picture me like that. <laughs> well, there's a million people picturing that right now. So one other thing, Chuck, the reason why, aside from like it's dangerous to just faint dead away, like that you can hit your head, you yeah. can break an arm, all sorts of bad things can happen to you. But one other reason why it's important to get treatment if you do have a blood injury injection phobia is because, um, like you said, there's that medical um, procedure anxiety that keeps you from going into the doctor's office. And that means that you're not going in for, like, vaccines or yeah. cancer screenings or, you know, wellness checkups um, because you're avoiding the doctor's office. So there's a, a lot of actual negative effects that it can have on your life. So if you do have that, maybe go check into getting treated because apparently they've got it figured out and you can not faint at the sight of blood or a needle anymore. That's right. You got anything else? I have nothing else, sir. Well, then, uh, that's it for Short Stuff, and Short Stuff is out. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.